This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Eugene V. Debs, a graphic biography by Paul Buell, Steve Max, and Dave Nance, and illustrated by Noah Skyver. Dynamic and beloved American radical, labor leader, and socialist Eugene Victor Debs led the Socialist Party to federal and state office across the United States by the 1920s. Imprisoned for speaking out against World War I, Debs ran for president from prison on the Socialist Party ticket, receiving over one million votes. Deb's life is a story of labor battles in industrializing America, of a fighting socialist politics grown directly out of the Midwest heartland, and of a distinctly American vision of socialism. Mike Davis praised the book like so. As socialists of Deb's era might say, here's the ammunition. In addition to being a delightful biography of the railroad man from Terre Haute, this is a splendid genealogy of the struggles and ideas that energize today's socialist revival. Buy an extra copy and turn on a friend or workmate. Eugene V. Debs, A Graphic Biography by Paul Buell, Steve Max, and Dave Nance, and illustrated by Noah Van Skyver. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm temporarily broadcasting from Santiago de Chile. I started The Dig a little over two years ago, and I began with what I knew best. U.S. history and politics, criminal justice, immigration, the border. And then I moved on to what I used to know really well, a decade ago when I was just getting started as a journalist, which was Latin America. And then I started to cover Europe and then the Middle East. Yet any comprehensive analysis of global capitalism, which is what this podcast, Step by Step, aims to be, is quite obviously woefully insufficient without a careful appraisal of China. Today, my guest is sociologist Jenny Chan, and we're discussing China's political economy, class conflict, and workers' movements. In the U.S., China is often viewed at best as a nefarious and enigmatic rival, and at worst, as a civilizational enemy. But these tales of national rivalry that permeate both major parties and the mainstream media function as a mystification, shrouding the global supply chain that connects capitalist exploitation from east to west. When we cut through the noise, a rather different picture emerges. China is a big place and home to a massive portion of the world's working class, a class that is struggling against the combined forces of state and global capital for dignified lives. And these struggles, contrary to conventional wisdom, are deeply connected rather than opposed to worker struggles in the West. Whenever the workers of one country are pitted against those of another, bosses win. This is what nationalism does. We must reject xenophobic and narrowly protectionist frameworks. It is our task to make manifest these struggles' latent ties if we are to mobilize the global movement necessary to transform the global political economy, which is precisely what we must do to avert climate catastrophe. I plan on doing more episodes on China, But I wanted to start by focusing on the labor movement because solidarity with the Chinese working class is critical not only for the material well-being of workers everywhere, but for the survival of human life as we've noted on this planet. Borders work for capital by imposing division, which nurture not only paranoid far-right nativists, but also the social democratic delusion that we can find purely national solutions to the thoroughly global problems posed by neoliberal fossil capitalism. But yes, before we get started, I must ask those of you who can afford to support this podcast at patreon.com slash the dig to do so so that we can afford to provide every episode for free to listeners all over the world who cannot afford to do so. 
We have a newsletter for supporters at $5 a month or more. We have left-wing book swag for supporters at $10 a month or more, including Jacobin's ABCs of Socialism, Assad Haters' Mistaken Identity, and Feminism for the 99%, a manifesto by Cynthia Rutza, Tithi Bhattacharya, and Nancy Fraser. That's patreon.com slash the dig. People often say that they keep meaning to donate, but they are listening while they're driving or whatever, and then forget. Are you driving or at the gym or wherever right now? If so, then please make a mental note to donate when you're back at your computer at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Okay, here's Jenny Chan, a professor of sociology at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, vice president of the International Sociological Association's Research Committee on Labor, and the author of Dying for an iPhone, Apple, Foxconn, and the Lives of Chinese Workers, co-authored with Mark Selden and Poon Nai, and forthcoming from Haymarket. Jenny Chan, welcome to The Dig. Thank you so much. What the Chinese government classifies as mass incidents, protests, strikes, riots, and other forms of unrest have been on a sharp rise for quite a while now. And while the government prioritizes continuing high levels of economic growth as the key to maintaining stability, that very same system of rapid growth also produces instability. How should we analyze this contradiction? And how has Xi Jinping's political economic program shaped the landscape of class conflict in China? There are so many different types of protests and conflicts that are so big. And it has been going on since the 1990s until now. Conflicts around so many different issues from land, labor conflicts, especially when workers were not paid on time or they are forced to do so much overtime, injuries, death. And there were also protests around environmental issues, pollution, air pollution, water pollution. The government had been quite alert about the rising numbers of challenges from all these different groups of people, including workers, peasants, and environmentalists. I would see a deep contradiction here because there were so many rights or interests that people should be entitled to. But in reality, we cannot just exercise them. So this is the problem. And the way to express their discontent is to take direct actions. In terms of the labor area, the official trade union is not that effective and therefore workers will use direct action to fight for compensation and some other are actually calling for a reform of the trade union. So these are some more direct ways instead of going through the time-consuming and burdensome legal avenue to address their concerns. Of course, lawsuits have been also on the rise. So protest or some other legal channel, these are have no contradictions in between, but they are all on the rise. We have record a high number of lawsuits or arbitrations, but at the same time, there have been all the blockage that they cannot get their justice done in the court, and therefore outside the courtroom, people go on the street to protest or to throw their own bodies from the buildings to kill themselves. As a labor activist as well as scholar, I'm really concerned about all these problems, and they are deep-rooted problems when China had undergone massive reform, market reform, with marketization, privatization, and more foreign investment. It doesn't mean that workers' rights are being better protected. On the way around, there were the cracks, all the different problems that come onto the surface. And what about this tension, this contradiction between the government and Xi Jinping prioritizing seeing economic growth as the key to stability, but that very same system of growth 
producing instability. It's sort of ironic. Well, yes. As we all know, China has become one of the most important economies in the world only after the U.S. and trying to overtake the U.S. in just like 10 or 20 years. These are the priority, the main concern, along with the economic growth. What we have to ask is, will workers have their fair share when they put in so many hours of work? Will they get their labor contract? Do they get steady increase in their wages and benefits? Sure, the cost, like the wage, the manufacturing cost that had been on the rise since early 2003 under the previous administration of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, and now under President Xi Jinping, there have been all the talks about prosperity, that China will also go abroad, invest in Africa, invest in the Belt and Road project. So we all, with all these indicators, we do see the stronger China as comparing to 40 years ago. But the irony here is that workers also see the rising cost of living in terms of their rent, the housing price going so high that no one as an average factory worker could imagine to have their own home in the city. And remember, we are still talking about nearly 300 million migrant workers. These are the rural migrants. They are allowed to get to different cities to work. And yes, they are also working very hard. They got their increase in terms of the minimum wage. But when we talk really the long-term plan, will they be able to support their children in the city, to provide them with good education, to buy themselves a house, to settle down, to have their root sunk in the city. All these are important concerns for a family. And therefore, I would see that as China had become economically stronger, it doesn't mean that the majority of working people are sharing the proportional benefits or the rights are better protected. On paper, China is the most unionized country on earth, but the reality isn't so great. Workers almost never exercise rank-and-file control over unions, and those unions systematically collude with business and government to diffuse and block worker action. Explain what the All-China Federation of Trade Unions is and how it works in tandem with government and employers to as you write, quote, preempt the development of independent unions. The All China Federation of Trade Union, ACFTU, is the only official trade union in China. It is a central hierarchical body with the party state on the top, Beijing the center, and then all down to the workplace level. We have what they call the grassroots union, or what we more precisely talk about as the company union or enterprise level union. So there have been some factories. Workers get together to bargain with their management and to build their union by elections, where workers nominate rank and file employees as the candidates for the chairman position, vice chair position, The problem is that the power imbalance is so obvious. Managers will quickly co-opt the worker leaders, maybe to promote them or just to fire them when they become very vocal, to really fight for a new increase in terms of their wages or to get more power in their own hands. So these are the negotiations or the bargaining that have been going on. And not many successful examples indeed. That is the reason why many scholars and observers have been criticizing the union as fake union because it doesn't gain any confidence of these workers. When workers see that the union are indeed dominated or controlled directly by the managers, no one will trust that the union will represent me to solve my problems, right? And most of the unions at the workplace level are in fact overtaken by the management. So the managers will 
have their own people occupying all the key positions and what could be brought on the table. The agenda is not really about improving the wages, get more voices from the workers to improve occupational safety and health, to concern about women workers' rights, to protect the pregnant or to provide better maternity leave or pensions. It is not all about these issues. And most of the time, it's quite ironical that the managers will just streamline the labor force by getting more contingent workers, student interns, or dispatch laborers to control or to even cut the cost. So this is undermining job security for the majority of the workers. And therefore, yeah, up to this point, except one or two specific cases, we can see the union is functioning, but the most of the other cases, we do see the problem right here. But I do not mean that union is not important. Union is so crucial in the labor movement. And therefore, workers nowadays are not just fighting for very short term economic gains. They are hoping to get a more representative institution. So I really have strong support or even (laughs) hope that in China, workers, one day, they would reclaim their union and really design what the union should do on their behalf. Because workplace democracy really means a lot. It is not just about giving you 100 or 200 yuan per month more. It is really about whether we treat workers as the important asset in a workplace and that we respect them and we work together with employees. But of course, I just have to add one more point right now. The workplace union is both controlled by the government as well as the boss. And neither party would want to see a strong worker organization because the challenge from the workers, that would be huge. And this is the reason why the Chinese government also do not seem to genuinely reform the union, despite all the talks on being more responsive to workers to reform the union by elections. But the progress still is extremely slow and small. In more theoretical terms, how do hegemony and repression respectively, function to undermine the labor struggle in China. In other words, to what extent are workers repressed through the state's and employer's brute force? And to what degree do workers buy in to the political economic program because they buy into the dominant state-sponsored ideology? Well, this ideology is not that powerful or penetrative, I would say. There are cracks, there are gaps and discrepancies, and workers see them very clearly. Explosions, fires, accidents, is almost happening daily. Even in factories where Apple produces its high-tech gadgets, including the smartphones we are now using to do this interview, <laughs> yes. these are produced under some dangerous conditions. There have been the use of toxic chemicals in the manufacturing process. And it is only until all these two or three years when Apple come up with the fullest of prohibited chemicals or toxins in the manufacturing process. We are now talking about all these supply factories. And imagine there are still many more black factories. They are small in scale, and they are much less visible on the top tier along the long supply chain. So I just have to emphasize that in China, the labor conditions are highly uneven. There are office people, there are some other better off workers who tend to be okay with the current situation. But the pent up anger and frustration among the majority, that is already giving the big signal to our government that things are getting unstable voice of pain and suffering that has been gonna to be a state that is quite intolerable between what you just put hegemony. Will workers really buy in and trust in our government? 
I do believe that for all those workers who have been engaging in strike and protest, they see clearly the huge gap between what is written on the book and what is there in reality. Most of the time, I can tell you, <laughs> it is the media or independent media, more progressive media like the deck and other people who are concerned and who try to listen, who are. Uh, Providing some support, like the labor rights groups, the Hong Kong group of activists who crossed the border and then stand in solidarity with the workers who are the most oppressed or marginalized. This is the civil society forces that I see rather hope. Instead of from the top down, there have been some better laws since 1995. The labor law, and then more than a decade later, in 2008, we come up with the labor contract law. After more than 10 years, we need another law because the very first labor law was just very nice on the paper, but it is toothless. So between the law and what. Could be really exercised in the hands of the workers. They are not the legal rights. They are the rights being violated. And it was at the precise moment when the law is broken and when the rights is not realized, then they understand they have to fight it back with their own hands. And therefore, this is no wonder why we could see all the headlines about demonstrations, protests that have been quite clearly documented by the China Labor Bulletin with their interactive map. But given the heavy censorship, we could never expect that it is the whole population, right? It is just a small piece, the tip of a huge iceberg. Workers in China, indeed, have been. Paying the high human cost behind the so-called economic miracle since the late 1970s until now, 40 years on, we should be more hopeful about the change in the legal system. And in reality, the protection is very important. However, the gap is also so huge that we we must see it. Sharply and critically, that how to ensure workers and other classes, including students or more progressive scholars, progressive independent journalists, all of us could work together in some way to make the society better and to make the voices very clearly to the government that, despite the fact that you try to. Take away the blog post from the internet to only control Xinhua or other mainstream media to make your own voice being heard. But there have been social media and the use of cell phone by the whole new generation of workers. So we, no matter what, will try to put forth the truth. So these are the tug and war, the ongoing negotiations and the bargaining. Every day between the state and the people. More specifically, and more recently, what role has Xi's efforts to elevate his own image and person, and to elevate Xi Jinping thought? What role has that played in shaping the political economy and class conflict, labor conflict in China? We have seen many political analyses that. President Xi Jinping <laughs> is the most important paramount leader, and that he might even have greater power than Chairman Mao. Of course, very clearly, we already learn about the、um, change in terms of the constitution, and very likely, the president and vice president could go beyond their two terms. That means totally going beyond ten years and continue with their leadership. There have been so many different terms the authoritarian regime, but this is also a very much contest authoritarian regime. On the one hand, he is so powerful, and it is all different aspects from education, patriotic education, the new syllabus in the school. To posters and banners, propaganda also in terms of the factories on the street, in the mainstream TV programs and newspapers and so on. So it seems that he is the one who could 
take control over the military courts and also different and important ministries and bureau from the central level to grassroots level. It is a multi-dimensional and multi-departmental effort in terms of shutting up dissidents critiques or some other criticisms and it has been quite intimidating the power to just get people into the jail or what we call the re-education camp and some other other means that are full the full use of violence and brutal force that is so scary even last month when I crossed the border to Shenzhen to conduct field work at some point of time, I'm also a little bit concerned about my own safety. And I am sure journalists in China also face massive pressure in terms of reporting some incidents that are seen as embarrassing or um, just really serious in undermining the governances in different regions. These are how President Xi Jinping projects himself as the leader, a strong man, that all the challenges would be put under control. But on the other hand, all these voices and challenges and critiques also make him quite embarrassing because we all see how human rights lawyers, their wives and other people have been getting hold of the international media <laughs> and expose the fact, right? And just like labor rights scholars, we keep on writing. We also do some comments, taking interviews like what we're doing right now. The ultimate goal is just to really be fair to all these working people. Without laborers who produce the wealth and direct profit, China would not be strong. <laughs> and so now we have to look into the deep problem. The basic protection by the contract, the institution of trade union, and the wage itself, the wage, it is just a little bit more than the minimum wage for even big supplier factories, and therefore how to rework the imbalance to ensure that workers also have their dignity, have their basic economic livelihood, to have their family be protected. I think all these are the real production and social reproduction issues that we have to look into. That means it is not just about work, work, and more work. It is also about life, yes. <laughs> about how they have some fun yeah, with their families. How do they enjoy their leisure hours on Saturday or Sundays? It is all these qualities that make China to be respectful. And it is not just about one figure who might be ruling for another five years, 10 years, or even 20 years. The governance structure should be included with education, vocational training, workplace democracy. And in a broader arena, it is really about human rights issue as well. For me and my colleagues, we all have high hope in building a better China we want to do research, and they are the rigorous kind of research that will produce new knowledge. But we are not just hoping to publish. We also strive to create change. Social change and research should be going hand in hand. And we believe that some of the suggestions are important or policy recommendations that could be heard by the government, like improving public housing for the workers who will no longer be squeezed into the what we call the village into the city and that they are the cram houses, very small and unsafe. You got fire in Beijing just in the winter of 2017 that kills like tens of people. So it is not just chase away and to categorize them as the low end population, as if <laughs> the whole city is not built by them, then when there are problems, you just try to kick them out. It is not the way what we think about China should be. And therefore, to go deeper into the China dream, 
it does mean how people's voices could be heard and their rights be guaranteed. And without the involvement of workers and participation in everyday life, decision making in the school, decision making in the factory, I don't think one man rule or a strong elite state at the top level would be sustainable. And in fact, it is not because President Xi Jinping also see clearly when he wants to combat the tiger or the flies. They are the big and small people who are involved in bureaucratic corruption, and these are deep-rooted problems. There are rules and regulations, but they are not observed. These are the problems at different levels and built in every corners, including the fake medicine or fake vaccine, the food unsafe, food dangerous, food that will be poisoning. There are. Big big issues every day, and for us who are focusing on labor rights issues, this is just a part of it. It is our specialized area, and we still see so much injustice and inequalities in it. And we want to fight back. We want to have a change, but the space where we could do it, it is also shrinking. Given the passage of the so-called foreign NGO laws, even Hong Kong groups will be seen as the outsiders. And in terms of funding, in terms of the agenda or the services that we could directly provide for the migrant workers in the hospital, in the dormitory, or in the community, all these are narrowing compared with five years ago or ten years ago. Ten years ago, we could still do massive. Investigation that are joined hands by universities in different places, including Hong Kong. But nowadays, with all these sensitivity in terms of investigation or research, many other meaningful projects have to be scaled down, or we have to just do it much more careful when we compare with just a few years ago. It it, it seems to be almost the worst. Years that we ourselves are experiencing. Defenders of the Chinese system and status quo, of course, would argue that it has lifted more people out of poverty and faster than any system in history. My question is: One, is this just a conventional defense of capitalism, a capitalist apologia with Chinese characteristics? And two, is there a better alternative to the status quo? That would ensure not only growth, but also that the fruits of that growth are more equitably shared. Well, inclusive growth is what we imagine, <laughs> but this really requires fundamental logic and reworking in China. Until now, the condition are so desperate that many young workers share with us they. Have been working so diligently, twelve hours a day, thirty days in a month. But still, it is just hand to mouth. It is not enough for the whole family. Wages increase could only go that far without any political institution like trade union. I am not even talking about party or alternate parties. So China is indeed quite difficult in that sense. We have very unbalanced development. There were still very poor villages where children are left behind. Their parents already leave them at the very moment when they were born because parents have to work far away to get some money. And that is not possible to bring them with them in the city. So left behind children and the、uh, perpetuation of poverty in the next generation. These are the big issues for China's growth or the pattern of its growth. It is still one of the most important nations in the whole world that have record high. Inequality level. No matter we are measuring by income inequality or wealth inequality, the gap, the lowering of the gap, is so little and limited. 
As we know, the speculation in real estate property, like selling and getting some more land to build high-rise buildings, hotels, these are some more lucrative business instead of working on the assembly line in the factory or you're serving as a a waiter or waitress in a hotel, in a restaurant. So all these are the low-end uh, surface work. Despite the fact that we have been talking about economic restructuring, we are not just relying on cheap export, but we also want to stimulate domestic consumption. We want to branch out to surface occupations. But don't re- forget that we have professional jobs, high-end knowledge work, but we have a majority of people who are still engaged in low-income, labor-intensive service work, and that is also seen as unskilled laborers. When you're older, you might also end up into unemployed situation. So we have been talking about the rise of the precarious jobs in China, and that makes you more unstable in terms of the job tenure. You will not be thinking about a permanent position like what we are in the university. You might be thinking about changing jobs every two to three months because you might want to just get more bonus when you sign up for a new job. There have been so many different ways to get temporary workers like that. So in China, the labor market is indeed becoming much more insecure than just 20 years ago. How to ensure that workers will have their decent family wage and to be safe and women workers would also have their rights to say no to sexual harassment or other sexual abuses. These are the real everyday issues we should look into. China is now such a big part of the global economy in terms of the traditional ways we think about capitalism. How does China's experience force us to think about it outside of the more narrowly Western model that, let's say, those of us who are Marxists in the West have often thought about it? On the one hand, in China, the role of the state is actually very strong and penetrating. The government could shape what kind of businesses open up to the world while the pillar industries are still very much monopolized or under their own hands to be controlled by them. So there have been some terms on state capitalism. It is not just about market and supply or the capitalists who are shaping the rule of the game, but it is also how the government position itself. And quite many times we have seen at the ground level, the government providing special loans and preferential policies, tax breaks and some other advantages to the investors. This is really changing the coastal region as well as the inland provinces. So what we have seen is not just about the dominancies or expansion of the capital. It is, of course, taking place, but it is all the time with the strong support of the local states on their back to reduce the time of export or import to provide special support by having infrastructural growth, the airport, the port, the highway, and then also with land and especially human resources nowadays. Based on our research, we have been seeing how the government would also influence vocational school and then bring in the young people as the interns to provide the new source of cheap hands at labor-hungry factories. Some people might term it as the developmental state, but what we see is just to ban some laws and regulations in favor of capitalist investment. This is more predatory rather than developmental. That is rather short-sighted by destroying the environment and sacrificing workers' rights. So within China, we have seen all these issues about how the government as well as investors, they are twisting arms or joining hands in downplaying workers' voices so as 
the fact that they could accumulate the wealth. Or to have their own goals to materialize, and outside China, going abroad, it is driven by the Chinese government on the one hand under the Belt and Road Project. But to look deeper into the Belt and Road Project, is this in fact because of the over? Production crisis that is now China facing, and therefore surplus capital have to be invested in some territories so that the gains are higher up rather than investing within China. Going abroad is also part of the diplomatic consideration here. China would. Emphasize its own importances in terms of international security issue to also dominate in internet or telecommunication development. So it is both the soft and the hard power that should be under our discussion. And for private capital or foreign capital, then they just take. The advantage or the good opportunity to expand overseas or to go offshore, so that they could ensure they have the global production network, and that they are not putting all the eggs in China in one basket. So that is just spreading out the risk in terms of business strategies. So yes, you're right. I would see the. Traditional model might have to expand a little bit and see how dynamic the capital as well as the state, as strong as the Chinese state, are reshaping the geopolitical environments, or how China is expanding quite fast, not only in the southeast region but towards Europe and farther away. We have seen the trade war between the U.S. and China, and that would be really hurting against each other. But the people who are most hurt in this kind of trade war is actually the workers. Workers are facing more unstable markets within China once the factories are. Out of business, it is they who will be suffering by not getting paid on time. So I think that there are many different layers or the macro and micro perspectives when we have to analyze how China has been changing and what kind of role that China is in the global capitalist political economy. And the crisis is pending. We have all read some reports about the financial debts China is facing, the fiscal instabilities, and. Needless to say, the serious issue about pollution. Also, there are many serious crises that are just postponing instead of having the root solution to deal with them. So we do have to get very fundamental restructuring, and it is not just a piecemeal way of. Getting more job in terms of the platform economy, you have more apps to do delivery work, or you have more new kind of jobs in the market. They are the jobs that are also without good regulatory regime at the moment. And here or there, we see new problems that are coming onto the surface. The model that China is now in is not sustainable and not. Democratic. I want to talk about the history of how the current labor exploitation regime emerged in China. You describe a two-part process: on the one hand, getting rid of old industries and their workers, and on the other hand, creating new industries with new workers. One side of this process was the privatization and reorganization of state firms, which, in the decade following 1993. Led to a 44 percent reduction in the state workforce. The other side of the process was the freeing up of agricultural workers in the countryside for what we might call proletarianization. Explain these two developments and their trajectory since Deng Xiaoping took charge in 1978. This is a very difficult developmental history of China. Because it involved tens of millions losses of jobs in the state sector, we have seen more than sixty million 
older workers who lost their jobs in the wave of privatization, which had been taking place during the eighties, but much more accelerated during the nineteen nineties, and then throughout the two thousand decade, the protest against privatization that had been still ongoing. Our readers might have heard about the iron and steel factory in the north east of China. There had been the workers who had been protesting for years, even until two thousand nine, against the restructuring of the state-owned factory. This is a very radical transformation in China, with those who had won being hailed as the masters of the nation, and now they are falling from their grace and to become the unemployed or those who have to get the jobs through the agencies, and they become the dispatch laborers without enjoying. The full benefits from the time they were born to the time they pass away, and not only themselves but with their families, they could enjoy housing or some other benefits. But these are all reduced much in size in many other state-owned factories. So this is one clear path that we see the loss of the old workers' plight as well as their economic protection. It is a painful history when we nowadays not only focusing on the miracle, economic miracle, but we also pay some attention to the human sacrifice in it. Okay, parallelly, because of the opening up, we have the pirate capital. We have those from Hong Kong, Taiwanese, or from the West. These new foreign investment really make the competition much fierce than in the past. So, with strong market competition, the employers also squeeze their benefits and wages because the abundant supply of young laborers from the countryside. This is the new source of the young workers, but they are not completely proletarianized. That means. They are, on the one hand, selling their labor power in exchange for wage. I work for ten hours today, and I will get a certain amount as my wage in the end of the month. So this is a kind of selling your labor in exchange of the wages. On the other hand, because of the legacy of the socialist era, quite many of them still have the small farmland. Back in their birth village, so with the land as the production resources you have, you are not completely on your own. You do have the land to fall back on. So this is the analysis of semi or incomplete proletarianization. But I want to emphasize here now: if we just rely on the small piece of agricultural land. You will not be starving, but it is also no way for you to think of a better life in the city, or let alone to give your children a better life. Today is really not like in the fifties or sixties when you got free education or very low cost medical care. Nowadays, everything is commercialized and commodified. You do have to pay hundreds or even thousands to get your basic necessities. When I talk to many young rural migrants who are now in their twenty years old, twenty five years old, or thirty years old, do you know what they tell me most? They are really worried about their love dating. Whether they could find their lovers, now where are they living? They are living in the dormitory, where no matter you are married or single, you only have the single bunk bed, maybe a lower bunk or upper bunk, but that is a shared dormitory. You do not have your place. Okay, you are trying to rent a small apartment in the city, but the price for just ten square meters. It could go up to a thousand yuan or even more than that per month. It is really crazy, and your wage will never increase as fast as the rent. So these are all the very sad and hopeless 
moment when they talk about their frustrations. They are longing for love, and the gender imbalance issue. The time they have been putting all on their work, they did not even have the moments when they have some exercise or to have their leisure. So how can you talk about love <laughs> and dating? So when I look back. On the one hand, it is the transformation of the state sector, while at the same time we see the huge expansion in the private or non-state sector, and there had been urbanization. The new group of workers who don't quite care about whether they have their farmland or not because they have never thought of going back. There's no way for them to go back. This is the trap. I want to talk about young migrant workers and their frustrated dreams. in In 2010, thirteen young workers at Foxconn, one of China's largest companies, it's a Taiwanese company, but one of the largest companies in China, it employs, I think, about one million workers and supplies major brands like Apple. Thirteen young workers attempted to commit suicide, with twelve, I believe, succeeding. And you write, "quote On the factory floor." Work stress associated with the race to the bottom and the just-in-time production mode is intense. Suicide is merely the extreme manifestation of what migrant workers in their hundreds of millions experience. Some suicides may have been triggered by personal troubles, as Foxconn management would like to claim, but there is a broader social context shared by its workers and many others that underlies. The desperate individual actions. Can you say a little bit about what Foxconn is as a company? This raft of suicides about a decade ago, and what it reveals about the conditions that workers live and work under, and as you're saying, this this contradiction between these young migrants' dreams and the reality they face. Before 2010, I don't believe that there were many people who have even heard about Foxconn, and there had been some journalist media interview that would put it as dot com, Fox dot com, or Foxconn. That people cannot just get it right as Foxconn, but Foxconn is actually an electronics. Factory that produced connectors in the very beginning in the 1970s. This is a company that was formed in 1974. They set up their very first factory in the southern part of China in 1988, when China opened its door wider to Hong Kong and Taiwanese investment. And over the decades, Foxconn becomes the largest electronics. Supplier or the electronics contract manufacturer. So, what does it mean? They build on orders. They receive Apple, HP, IBM, Dell, Google, and so many big names you could ever name. They are all their customers. Foxconn occupy the central node of production. The largest production base is in China. But Foxconn is indeed also a global corporation. They do have their new factory that is in Wisconsin in the U.S., and they also invest a lot in Vietnam, in India, Indonesia, and all different parts of the world. So Foxconn becomes so huge. There are so many different factors, but one key factor is indeed the more than one million young workforce. In China alone, and in 2010, when Foxconn was producing the original iPad, and workers have been racing against time to produce iPad as well as the upgrade iPhone. I interviewed one suicide survivor, and she shared with us. That she could never got the opportunity to use the Olympic swimming pool inside the factory. There's also no time for her to use the tennis courts. So Foxconn, it is indeed a self-contained production complex. There are multi-story dormitories. There are sports and exercise facilities. And soon after the suicide. They even have their anti-suicide nets, what they call the safety nets. 
was installed everywhere to catch the jumpers. So it is so scary, I would say, in a way. From the distance, it is such a high-tech and very advanced factory. It is great. It is grand. But when we talk about the management system, it is also one of the most terrifying factory regime we could ever record. Foxconn founder and head Terry Go once said, quote, "A leader is a dictator for the common good. In workers, you write, they live in these cities within a city, within which the company exercises." Basically, unchecked policing power, including widespread surveillance and abuse. Terry Go himself served military in Taiwan. He is now the number one wealthiest person in Taiwan. His own character is, in a sense, also very dominating. And he would even compare employees as animals. So managing one million animals、uh. to him is such a big headache. Okay, but even at the peak of suicides, what he had been thinking about is just to set up the hotline so that workers could share their distress. But once workers call in, they get the personal details and fire them. So as to get rid of the risk, it is even far worse than just a machine because you, you, in fact, you are the human. You will have the sense of pride, dignity, and you don't want to be always shouted at. But these are the daily pattern. Even when workers share with us that they have done nothing wrong, they will be just shouted at to speed up. So it is not just about how tough and despotic, how harsh the discipline is. You got all the banner and the slogan to tell you that every second counts, every minute counts, and you cannot waste one second because wasting one second means wasting money or losing the profit. So you are always under huge pressure, and day and night never ends. Even during holidays, you will see that Foxconn is. Ramping up new models, but the second level then is why? Why they have been pushing so hard? And we have to got a little bit political economy analysis here and talk about profit margins. Exactly, there have been analysis about the breakdown of the iPhone four cost, and that is nearly sixty percent of the profit. The gross profit will goes into the hands of Apple alone because Apple. Dominate design, branding, and marketing, and then only about one fifth of the cost are the raw materials that are built in for a smartphone, and it is less than two percent that is for the wages of Chinese workers. So we can say that Foxconn is a super low margin or very thin margin business in terms of the bargaining for the profit. Their bargaining power is also quite low, in the sense that you can only get very huge, massive volume of the order, but your gains is so thin, so little. When Foxconn themselves have also to earn a lot, that means the portion that could be into the pocket of the workers will be even less. So the real dictator behind the dictator are companies like Apple that enjoy these enormous margins. On their sales of final consumer products, while demanding such low costs and imposing such low margins on their suppliers like Foxconn, not to excuse Foxconn, but they're really in a secondary position in terms of the power relationship here in the global supply chain. To some extent, it is definitely an interdependent model. Apple cannot deal without Foxconn. Likewise, Foxconn have to depend on Apple to get its own business. Despite the fact that Foxconn also want to build its own brand and to come up with new robotics and other high tech product of its own name. But so far, these big, huge global corporations they use their power to shape. The supply chain, and they like Apple always pit one supplier against the other to compare Foxconn with Packetron, or to compare Packetron with Campbell Electronics or、uh, Vistron or others. Apple can bargain one with the other. Even though we can see that so far, 
when Foxconn seems to bring such a bad reputation in the press and causing much trouble to Apple <laughs> and other image conscious companies, including HP and Dow, you can see they do not really cut off from each other. They do rely on the other to produce. This is the reason why when we are producing our book, the provisional title is Dying for an iPhone. There are two meanings here. At one level, we are really talking about the workers who have been really struggling between life and death because they have been working day after day, night after night with such a meager little income. And to die is a kind of desperate protest. This is not a life that is worth living. Well, I'm not saying that suicide is something that should be supported. It is absolutely not. But I'm trying to convey a sense of desperation with those migrant workers who have been leaving behind their poems, their songs, or their uh, letters. We all see the deep pain and agony in their life. But the second meaning of our book title, Dying for an iPhone, is also we should take this opportunity to think about global consumers. We cannot wait for another second for a new iPhone or another new iPad. Of course, we, we also want maybe a uh, Huawei smartphone or a Samsung cell phone. It, it is just quite similar because everything is built more or less the same by Foxconn. Consumers, to some extent, are also driving the momentum that workers are doing day and night to satisfy. And if we consumers could understand better about how these goods are being produced and what workers will put under the inhumane conditions, I thought this would be very powerful that we rethink whether we really need to change our iPhone every year or less than a year (laughs) and what other costs behind it for our environment as well as the people. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be, and you can support them on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon and by, well, good question who. You frequently hear ads right here from Verso, University of California Press, and coming soon, N Plus One. We are now looking for new publishers to advertise with us. Do you write or work for a magazine or book publisher? If you do, can you think of any group of people more interested in buying smart left-wing books and magazines than Dig listeners? Because, well, I sure can't. If you want to advertise your media product on The Dig, email me at firstname, lastname at gmail.com. That's danieldenver at gmail.com. That is also, incidentally, where you may send me listener letters, which, as long as they are not intensely mean, I always do my best to respond to. Okay, thank you, and back to the show. So how do we in the U.S. or or people who are consumers of these products more generally, how do we work to help connect the labor struggle up and down the supply chain? In other words... How could, ideally, people in countries like the U.S. who are simultaneously workers with their own struggles here, but also consumers of Chinese-made goods, act successfully in solidarity with Chinese workers? We have to push Apple and other companies to be more transparent. Now, every year, they spend billions of dollars on their PRO, (laughs) the public relations or publicity thing, with their very rosy and beautiful, colorful annual report and what they call as the corporate social responsibility report. Or sometimes they even put it so blunt and say, supplier responsibility. Okay, this is not my (laughs) responsibility. It is our suppliers who do not follow the rules or the regulations. No, that is not true. It is how you take up your responsibility, provide more resources to work with the suppliers as well as independent 
trade unions or labor researchers to transform the workplace. So that is one step. We, the consumers, will not be easily treated by your report in a way that everything is going fine. No, you are not serving as a policeman. We are telling you the fact that you are pressuring the suppliers to go to the bottom and that the race against the time would also have the bad consequence and the real negative impact onto workers. And then the second important way that we can meaningfully intervene is we learn about the struggles in China, in India, or even I hope not, but in Wisconsin or some other parts in the U.S. where Foxconn and other investors are also building their new factories. It happens already when we read the newspapers. There were young interns, there were workers who had been doing their jobs, but at very low wage or not being effectively protected. So what I mean is workers around the world should really stand up and join their hands together because unity is power. It is not just the lonely fright in China. It is the workers' solidarity exchanging their experiences. So consumers could say yes and support all these efforts. It is not as concrete or as simple as boycotting iPhone. Okay, you don't use iPhone, then maybe we just use some other phones, but... It is not a way of taking a more proactive position. We do want to show our strength and our concern to workers' health and women's rights and so forth. So as consumers, we can always support workers when they go on their struggle. We understand that they are fighting for their basic rights and justice. And we also show them support by signing online petition, or if possible, maybe we can also do more talks and exhibitions within our campus. And there are also public events that we can organize so that everyone looks closer into now the situation is highly unequal where we got the brands who are monopolizing or, or dominating on global production, while workers who are at the far end of the supply chain, they are the one who are under huge stress to get their work done. So these are the knowledge and information that I believe we can actually do more to disseminate. We can also write letters to these companies and express our voice, or we can also suggest some policies, recommendations for our government so that the environment as well as people could all be protected. It seems like there could also be real possibilities for worker solidarity across borders here in terms of, let's say, Apple retail workers in the U.S. who have their own struggles. If they were to get more organized and powerful in the future, they could be a a critical ally to Chinese workers farther down the production chain. I believe that we are conceptualizing workers in really a broad sense. We are also laborers to some extent, but we are just within the higher education sector. But there are also our fresh graduates who will join into the labor market very soon. So everyone, in a sense, are both. We are both the producer and we are also consumer. And uh, there are different positions we are in. Some are in retail marketing sales, while the others are inside the factory in the manufacturing jobs. The most important thing is now, sometimes in China, the political circumstances become so tight, like a strict jacket, that even you cannot possibly hold a banner because the next second the police will come up and then grab your banner and even make up an excuse and put you into the jail or detention. Workers in Jazik, in another factory in Shenzhen, when these workers are trying to build their union, they are being suppressed and that involve more than 50 young students from all over China. So I just want to emphasize that when we talk about international solidarity or regional alliances, 
that are、uh, opening up whole new imagination and to broaden the battlefield. But the real battleground is still at the workplace or in the very immediate community. These workers, when they are detained, they even do not have their right to see the lawyer because the lawyer will be under the threat that their license will be revoked. So many lawyers actually have their own families as well. They just say sorry and they say bye bye. So without representation, workers themselves are under huge stress. And for those of us who want to do more, they just cut it off. They cut it off from fundraising initiative. They cut it off from people who can maybe take a look and say, "Are you okay?" Or you are under different kinds of torture, mental torture or physical confinement. There are so many terrible things that could. Happen, and we just don't know because it is such a big black box. The real enemies are not just about the greedy employers or the factory boss. Yeah, it is really much more complicated, and therefore, you never know who could be your trustworthy alliance in China. But even though I I seems to be so negative or so desperate right now. This is also the brightest moment I've ever seen in China, with the very young generation. They know so much about Karl Marx, Chairman Mao, or some other progressive ideas, and they quote it. They write their petition, they put it onto their statement, and they create a new website. And that is so technologically resilient that it is not yet broke. <laughs> I think this is amazing. This is a miracle. They are so brave. I could say sometimes even much courageous than me. I'm just sitting down, putting some articles in front of the computer, but they are really there on site, providing all different kinds of supports to the families or to the workers who are in need of support. One really central facet that we haven't. Discussed yet to how labor exploitation is organized that we should really highlight before we get any further is how rural migrants are actually criminalized internal migrants because under China's system they lack residency rights in the cities where they labor. Briefly explain the Hoku system, its origins and continued existence, and how it functions for Chinese capitalist capitalism in the state today. Everyone in China will basically fall into two categories. If you are born in Beijing, then you are the local resident, the citizen, and you got all the rights: social insurance or the social services, public education. For those who are from the countryside who migrate into Beijing to work, they are the internal migrants. There are, in fact, some reforms. Let's say. For five years, if you do contribute by tax and you can buy your own house, <laughs> then you have the right to settle down. But how many people, how many migrant workers, on average, would have the savings to just get that? It is not possible. I have been to Beijing for several times now, and I see their miserable living conditions. Really, in the basement. So small, crowd living together, and not only them. Some other young graduates also do not have much economic standing power. There are the possibility of converting your rural household registration into the city one. The portion is so small, however, for these average rural migrants. For those who are the young professionals, it is another story. Maybe their chances are higher, right? So, in a very marketized situation, not even your children could possibly get a place in a primary school or junior secondary school and high school, and then finally college or university. It is not that. We can take it for granted in the states, or like me in Hong Kong, it is not really a big deal where I'm living in new territories, or I am living in Kowloon in Hong Kong. It is just no difference. But in China, we have these 
what you just put hukou or the household registration policy that is still in place. There have been some reform. Smaller towns or smaller cities, you might end up as so-called urban citizen. But in these big cities, they now also have their population control, and they want to actually push these low end. Population, no tech, no skilled migrants out. It seems like very forgetful. We cannot do without them. They are the sanitary workers. They are the one who are helping the production that earns China as the name. The world factory, and these are also some workers in the university campus, working in the canteen, working as the security officers, and so on. So we rely on hundreds of millions of vulnerable migrants. But it is also not possible for us to see the total cancellation of the hukou policy. The abolishment of the household registration policy may not be an immediate goal, for the governments have been relying on the system for decades. The way is to build second tier or third tier towns or smaller cities, so that perhaps the whole environment could be improved in terms of delivering education, healthcare, and basic housing. But in the reality, all these divided households are creating many family problems. We have seen in China the higher divorce rates, or the children could lose their childhood because the parents have no any means to bring you together and take care of you every day. Psychological problem, all other social issues that. Have been coming up. The hukou policy, the household registration policy, is one of the problems. But more than that, actually, because of the market nowadays, if you do have the complete right to stay here in the center of Beijing, can you tell me how much you have to earn a month so that you could possibly live here comfortably? So it is really down to the problem as the fact that you are earning so little, and why you are earning. So little, the employer might sometimes have the excuse that because you have something to fall back on, you can always get back to your birthplace, and then you have the land that you can hang on. But in fact, land grab is another big source of maths. Incident. It is the problems of land grab. You lose your land. You have no way to really fall back on. And city already becomes the young generation's new place of hope. I'm not talking about everyone can buy their house. It is not realistic. It's not possible nowadays, given the high rise、uh, rent and the housing price. But we should think about public housing or the government's responsibility in these central and essential areas of services. So to put it short, you are right. The rural urban gap is complicated by the household registration policy. Despite some reform, this is still one issue that we have to look into. Does this criminalization of internal migration, if that's the right way to describe it, does it function to segment the labor market for capital's benefit? Yes. Right now, the wage is so low, and why the wage is so low? Because the employers could always find the excuse that you can have your land. In the birth village to fall back on, so I don't really have to give you the full salary. In a sense that I am suppressing the cost. That is just good enough for you to stay here. You are living in our dormitory, and after one night sleep, you have breakfast, and then you work for twelve hours, and you come back, you sleep, and then you wake up and you work again. So it is just the minimal. A spatial environment that holds you here, while it is not a kind of welfare, it is just the lowest possible cost to keep you alive, so that you are right here, and I can always extend the working hours. I just say you have to do another two hours more to finish the job, and then you can go back to the dormitory. Dormitory is most of the time either built within the factory compound. 
or just adjacent to it. Um, so these are the very low cost economical means to keep a large group of migrants who are always mobile, but you have to pin them down to have them their labor power here and you have to make them alive not going to be sick and then they work again at the lowest possible cost the widespread use of dormitory is somehow tied to the fact that public housing is not that available in many cities and this again is how the local government positions itself the local government also take advantage of the household registration policy they also assume that you'll be right here to work for five years or ten years until you are just too old too sick and then you will be just kicked out from the factory and you will be going back to the small land so the local government seems to be not taking their responsibility to improve the lives of these immigrants, too. You've been following this insurgent young communist movement in China, which you referred to a bit earlier in the interview. These are students who are, somewhat ironically, drawing from the very texts of Mao, Marx, and Lenin that the Chinese state requires them to study to then indict the Chinese status quo and to fight for workers' rights. The government has responded with some pretty serious repression, including detaining a number of students who were helping workers at a southern China welding manufacturer organize an independent union, and forcing some of the students to film coerced taped confessions in which they apologize for helping to spread, quote, radical leftist ideology. Explain this communist youth movement, where it comes from, the repression they're facing, and what their future might hold. We see the strong alliance between university students and workers from Jurassic, one factory based in Shenzhen. And it is indeed just quite a small factory with a thousand employees. And until now, it's about eight months now, we can see that these young students, they are so genuine. During the summertime, even flying from Beijing, from Nanjing, from all over China to Shenzhen to give them support to fight for their immediate release. Because on the 27th of July, about 30 students, as well as the workers, they were being detained by the local police. And the reason was that they gathered the crowd to disrupt social order. Gathering the crowd to disrupt social order. What an excuse or legitimate reason to hold them. Soon they will be released with dozens of people. But still, four workers, they were detained until now and are being criminally charged no one knows what would be facing for these workers, but the students had never given up. These young students, they are very clear about their vision. They support workers to exercise their legal rights, and they understand that Jurassic is not an isolated incident. It is indeed quite similar to many other factory workers that the students have read about or the students themselves have interviewed during their winter break or summer break. So these young students, they have been having long-term concern about workers' lives. Many of them had read Karl Marx, Lenin, Chairman Mao, or some other Chinese classic literature. They had formed their reading group and they have been discussing within their own university life. So I just want to really emphasize that they have very clear conception about what they are doing. Young students, they see clearly the oppression here is very strong and that we have to change. And how to change it is to rebuild their own trade union. The students know that we have to form a unity and to fight back 
and stand in strong solidarity with them, just like what happened in 1919 when the May 4th movement, the young, brilliant university students at that time they were also fighting against imperialism and other oppression. Just like nowadays, they would stand up in front of the Jurassic management to stand in solidarity with the workers because they understand that this case would be setting up as an example how university students. Would join hands with the workers when it was the summer time. When they get into Shenzhen, they could not get the response from the local authorities, despite the fact that they are issuing open letters to call for dialogue with the district level governments, and then. Higher up, they also send a letter to the All China Federation of Trade Unions in Beijing. They have doing all the proper steps, taking all the different means to make their voices.、Um, and the fact was that these students were being taken away, especially after the twenty fourth of August. Up till now. According to our list, more than forty students who self-identified with Chairman Mao or Karl Marx. These young group of students are the one who are mostly attacked or taken the confessions in front of the camera, and those testimonies, what we believe, are not truthful or sincere. This is something like a script that they have to. Read out and confess that they are doing something illegal. For the Chinese government, the alliance between the university students and workers that had become so threatening that the authorities were expanding the scale of repression. This year is the thirtieth anniversary of the Tiananmen Square protests, which of course were infamously met with massive government repression. At the time, however, you note that there was also a major upsurge in worker militancy and moves to organize democratic unions. We we typically just think of the student protests, but there was also, you write, this huge worker movement. The Beijing Workers Autonomous Federation called for the ouster of unions' undemocratic leadership, and quote, and for quote, price stabilization, opposition to political oligarchy, and freedom of association. The threat at the time then wasn't just student radicalism, but also the possible development of a potent student worker alliance. Explain briefly what happened then, and if this is precisely the sort of alliance that the Chinese government fears today, and why the young communists are being met with such serious, severe repression. Let me be clear. Because I thought that is important for the security or safety of these young students now who were not even born thirty years ago on June fourth of nineteen eighty nine. So we just have to be careful about some similarities, but also huge differences. For these young workers who are very conscious about what they are doing, they have their own trajectory and their own growth, their background. Their own families or direct experience during their summer jobs, they understand the difficulties facing by syndicalists, the dying syndicalists, construction workers. They have been get hold of some other laborers who were also not paid, and some of them got the awakening when they are fighting against sexual harassment on public transportation or in their campus with the global influence of Me Too. Movement. Movement, etc. So there are new elements in their own core and with their own lived experience, so that they draw on themselves into the Jurassic workers and really fight for their good because they themselves know. They are going to graduate, and some of them had already graduated and decided to go into the industrial district. To live, to work together with the workers. So these are the very clear path that they themselves craft to build a stronger communist movement, or what we should call a socialist movement. That is not with the 
bureaucratic or the old burden of those terminology or ideology, but they are envisioning something new. They really get the new hope of democracy, fair pay, safety. And those very undemocratic rules and the systems, all these are gone because their own vision about agenda more equal. No matter we're talking about class or gender or some other dimensions, they have their own formulation. What happened thirty years ago? It was definitely a huge moment when China experienced. The transformation with market opening up, with inflation in the city, and the older generation of workers seeing the dictatorship and the undemocratic rule within their own Dangwei, within their own state units, there have been dramatic changes, and workers also have all their grievances. At that time, the university students have all those. New ideas from the West that they are calling for liberty, a new political system calling for freedom and autonomy. But some ideals are so, in a way, a little bit abstract from workers' own concerns. At the very beginning, at least in April and May of 1989, the unity between the students and workers were not that strong. It was only until the latter half that students came to have more trust with the workers. It also tends to be too late. The crackdown is motion, and we got the tanks driving into the Tiananmen Square and all those to clean up the massacre. It was such a tragic and unforgettable part of history in China. And now, thirty years on, we are still supporting the reinterpretation of that history, as well as looking forward and see what other ways that we can strengthen workers' rights, as well as creating more space for students to pursue their belief. Instead of believing into those terms and empty terminologies, yeah, we can read from the mainstream dominant text how we understand our governments, how we understand the party, or how we even have to interpret what has been going on in these forty years of reforms. And yet, students from their own experience, from their reading group critical discussions, they come up with a new, quite different version that we cannot just sit down here and believe the top-down delivery of rights or other gains. Everything you might have to really fight hard for, and this is the test when. Workers fight for their union in accordance with the trade union law. These students see that this should be highly respected. This is the moment that we should stand up and fight for them because many workers at the beginning were also beaten up by the police, right? So there have been some more immediate reasons for workers to say enough is enough, and that they. Want to stand up and show their support to the workers. Some of these kids are also from poor families. When they were very young, their mother brought them up because their fathers were either seriously injured on the construction site or they are going far away from work. So these are the. Years when they brought up, when China, on the one hand, we see the elimination of poverty, the high growth rate, the exports, the growth in GDP, that are true. But also the problems, including the disparity between urban and rural developments in China, as well as the educational system itself, it becomes so much commodified. And with all these young people who are searching for their own voice and standing on their own feet. They are reimagining a whole new vision, and that should be more open in terms of discussions and debates. And that if Chairman Mao's ideas on workers' participation, as well as some other ideals that are embodied in 
our state. We want to make it real instead of just repeating those empty words while they are meaningless to us. They are not going to give up, despite the fact that during the whole semester, the university are also joining hands with the authorities to so-called restructure the Marxist society or to cancel out other student organizations already, respectively, in people's university. And they kicked them out of a Marx study group. Yes, you're right. They already (laughs) kind of (laughs) disbanded two Marxist societies already. And then at Peking University, at Beijing University, basically all the 32 new members are the youth leech or the Communist Party backed young people. So they are not the original Marxists. The whole 32 original (laughs) Marxist group members, they are all gone. I mean, they are disqualified. They are already out. What we see is that the individual target is no longer the students themselves plus their parents. You just bring them, their parents, and say, your kids are being brainwashed. And that their parents, of course, will be frightened to death. This is a kind of relational repression. By relational repression, we means utilizing family ties or other significant relations put to such psychological pain and pressure to just ask you to give up. But they do not give up. Okay, so you are... Making one step further, instead of targeting individuals or in addition to targeting the individuals, you are targeting the groups now. You are using all the school regulations and all different kinds of tactics to kill these Marxist organizations so that they do not have organizational backup. And not only the university groups, there are also leftist websites, the magazine editors, they will also court and confess their scene on the camera. So there are also some other young activists. They had already graduated from two or three years earlier before, but they themselves keep up with their enthusiasm. They really try to figure out what we can do at this time in our time. It is not those days 30 years ago. It is now in the early 20s or mid 20s what time they should use in their lives so that this is a fulfilling life. This is not a life that they just want to become a manager or a professional, but they are even actually going into the industrial district to take up a job and to work together to become the worker representative and to hopefully transform the lives for these workers. They think these are the meaningful way of life. Students, which we've been discussing, are also a critical, are not just acting in solidarity with workers, they are also a critical part of China's increasingly casualized labor system, something you you, you alluded to earlier. Companies like Foxconn are using huge numbers of high school vocation student interns for assembly line work. And the scope of this really blew me away. In 2014, there were 18 million vocational high school students nationwide, which they hope to increase to 23.5 million by 2020. And in the U.S., we have a huge problem with the exploitation of intern labor you know, being used basically just to get work out of people rather than to provide any sort of educational experience. But what's going on in China is just on a different scale entirely. High school students are being integrated as a core feature of low-wage Chinese manufacturing. And this is work that they must do if they are to graduate. So as a result, they're basically denied workers' most basic power of withdrawing their labor by quitting because they can't do so without jeopardizing their education. They're paid less than ordinary workers. They work brutally long hours. And that work is typically entirely unrelated to their course of study. Contrary to the vocational school advertisements that you write, emphasize how important learning skills are to succeed in life. And then you have private labor agencies, these middlemen, the ones paying the students, but then taking a cut for themselves. And again, these are high school students as young as 16 working potentially 10 to 12 hour shifts, six to seven days a week 
well beyond what the law allows. What is going on and and how do student intern workers in particular and contingent workers more generally, what role are they playing in the current Chinese economy? It involves all these big fundamental issues about what education is for or for whose education. The use of student interns in car factories, in electronics factories, but also in hotel, in restaurant, or in what we call the new platform economy involving Amazon or other big tech companies like Alibaba or Jingdong. These are all different areas that are needing the young students as the cheap alternative because of the tightening of the labor markets. Despite China had relaxed the population policy, there's no longer a one-child policy. You can have up to two children. It is not just so magical that because of the loosening or the relaxation of the policy, then birth rate will increase suddenly because of the high cost of living, because of the very complicated considerations by those parents. So to put it short, the source of cheap labor from vocational schools, that is great because the government had been investing huge millions of dollars into building the new schools to train our skilled technicians so that China would be competing with the advanced economies. That was really the momentum behind the main China 2025 project. It emphasized on technological upgrading, artificial intelligence, robotics, high technology, and so on. So we need the educational system that it also on the same page. For some other students, they will have their entrance exam to get into college or university. But these, something like between 18 million to uh, more than 20 million students, they have to undergo a standard three-year program. For the first two years, the students will take some theories or classroom learning. And then in their final and third year, they have to do internship. That is mandatory. And that really creates the institutional opportunity for these employers to get their hands far extended into the school. The local government is now making a deal with the investors. Well, if you come and invest here in our city, we will not only guarantee the provision of land and other taxation benefits for you, but we are going to provide you with human hands. We are going to provide you with the young, very obedient laborers. And these interns, because legally they are still termed as the students, they are not recognized as employees. That means they are not entitled at all to social insurance. Well, this is cheap. This is good. You just have to pay them. And without providing them with any health care, pensions, or other kind of social insurance benefits. So in this sense, per head, per month, you are saving a lot. These are the young, cheap alternative. And if there are the strike, some employers may even just take in the young students as the strike breakers. This is not just for the own, I would say, sacrifice of the young students because when they are doing internship, they are not acquiring real skills training. But it is also at the harm of the co-workers. They would also have more difficulties to make their demands with their employers simply because they sense that they could be easily replaced by the young interns as well. The interns could be coming in tens of hundreds because this really depends on the size of the schools. We just mentioned Foxconn as the world's largest electronics manufacturer, and they are also the biggest employer of interns in the whole world, much, much bigger than Disney, for example. We understand that only in one summer of 2010, Foxconn alone would use up to 150,000 interns, 150,000 interns from dozens of vocational schools all around China. These young interns do not have their own choice to work. They are 
brought in as the cheap labor, and if you don't fulfill the internship requirements, you will not be able to graduate on time. So this is a new form of a slave labor or unfree labor. They do not have the freedom or autonomy or decision to choose the internship, and that should be matching with their majors of studies. But based on our research, those students are doing business marketing or. Accounting, arts—they are all from different subjects, and no one come here just to assemble the screws or the parts into an iPhone because that is not training you anywhere or uplifting your skills. We are not just talking about labor rights; we are also talking about educational rights. And some teachers even get a double pay because they got involved in these what we call the. Trade the human trade or the student trade business. The teachers got one paycheck from the company, and they will simultaneously get the pay from their own school because now they are not just teaching in the classroom. There's no need anymore. You go to the factory. You go along with the interns on site to make sure. These students will go to work on time, and they will only punch out after their overtime. They cannot just play on their PlayStation or just pretend that they are sick. You have to monitor their attendance. The teachers themselves becomes the supervisors. I'm not trying to blame those teachers because, to some extent, they also do not have their own decision to make. But these are very complicated, and you see that the momentum behind is that the governments have their regulations in terms of protecting interns that you have to. Go to internship because that would help you to combine theory and practice. But in the reality, for enterprises, they just think about the rock bottom prices when they get interns. Because in the past, there is even no law to regulate how much you have to pay them. Until 2016, we got a new regulations, and you have to pay them at least 80 percent of those. Like the new co-workers, but eighty percent means that the maximum <laughs> you can only pay them up to eighty percent, no matter how good they are performing during their six months or even one year internship. The one favorable condition is that the government had been expanding. Education system, not only the academic track but the vocational track. This is an irony, though. The enrollment into vocational school actually had been dropping in these most recent one to two years, as we are monitoring the national figures so far. And I do believe that one major reason for the not attractive enough in doing vocational school is. The abuses and exploitation in internship. How seriously is Chinese leadership taking climate change? How ambitiously are they thinking about the task at hand? And do they see a green transition as perhaps an opportunity to move beyond a low-wage fueled economic development model that is progressively running out of new cheap labor to exploit? For China, aiming at building more airports, highways, and <laughs> more new houses every day, I see the deep contradictions here. Of course, we have been talking about the phasing out of using coal or other dirty energies or resources and replace them with solar energy, wind, and water power. These are the green revolution that Chinese leaders are talking about, and have some emphasis on environmental issues to give more fines and penalties on those who break the law. More consistency is needed in terms of the implementation; otherwise, the cost would only be. Shared by the local residents or some other people who just cut corners. I am a little bit pessimistic in terms of global environmental practices. Right here, it is so difficult as we can see many nations when they come up with the 
reduction in terms of the emission of greenhouse gas or some other agenda that we want to have a stronger consensus. But always there are some parties who are trying to pull out. And after all, Donald Trump is not that cooperative either. No. <laughs> but of course, China has become such a big consumer of iron, steel, and other resources, energies, natural gas, and so on. Some are better alternatives than the others, and that the government really have to push more to do better. But in terms of doing better, we also have to have a better partnership with the green groups, the environmental experts in China and beyond China to work together. For many workers, we have been getting hold of Due to the fact that the production process is so toxic and dangerous, they got lung diseases, they got their um, allergic problems, skin problems, and sometimes the worst with their nervous, their central nervous system break down. That means they become paralyzed or they have some other deadly diseases like leukemia. So all these should be prevented. And I see a strong link here between occupational health and safety as well as environmental protection. This is becoming a, a big area that labor rights and environmentalist activists, we should join hands to figure out what to do better. And then with the policy, it demands more committed government officials as well as those who are from the civil society organizations to join hands and do better. But these are, again, very complicated and difficult issue. My last question is a more general one, like like the last one, is looking ahead at the future. What can the history of the rise of capitalism and the labor movement in Europe and the United States teach us about what is taking place right now in China and where China is heading? And by contrast, what are the pitfalls of trying to analyze present day China through the Western political economic past as we try to figure out where China is heading? China is not one unitary analysis unit. There are different parties, for example, the labor unions would be quite different from the commerce ministry. The local government officials who are taking care of environmental policies could be in deep contradiction with other government departments. So there are internal competing interests and different priorities and in different moments. I guess the first thing we have to understand better about the policies as well as the leadership, what directions or priorities are taking. Another thing is to go back into the history. There are some ideas and practices that are indeed good. If we are talking about industrial democracy or when labor workers are more glorious than what they are now, we can maybe draw some insights from our socialist history, even though it's just, I would say, quickly replaced by the more capitalist, market-oriented history in these most recent 40 years. But there should be some wisdom and energies that we could draw back from our very rich socialist Chinese history, or even maybe some moment before 1949, when we see the very vibrant moment when trade unions are standing up to fight and with intellectuals, concerned young students who are also joining hands to think about the future of China. I would prefer to have a more dynamic civil society that we could witness in China instead of now every non-governmental segments are either being closely watched or censored, and that there are really limited or shrinking space that we can use. And if we just take a look at these young students, they are advocating for justice or standing in solidarity with the workers or doing some different kinds of investigations. And they will be in such a big danger to suddenly disappear without 
anyone knowing where they are. This is intimidating enough, right? So just get to something very basic. If we are talking about the development of China, or to even think of the future ahead, we have to just get things to the most basic. There are competing interests among all different government units. It is not just one person who are dominating and could make everything under his own calculation. It is not that simple. There are always. Oppositions or different parties involved, but I am more interested in we thinking about the role of academics, intellectuals, labor rights activists, as well as some other progressive elements, including feminists or young feminists, and that we can combine our energies and resources to make a better society. So these are always. Putting us in direct conflict with those who are holding power, and they are the elite in the society. So we are ready for all these fights and battles. If we have our own readiness for this, I think we could really have some more progress. We can write more critical analysis. We can also make use of social media platform or other media space to make our voices being heard. So it would never be so simple as a top-down solution, or how China's model would be different from European or American model, and that we can transplant some other lessons. I would rather look back into our history and then to rely on more progressive elements nowadays to strengthen or to broaden our civil society, and that we are ready. To negotiate and bargain with those who are holding the power and resources, and just see how far we can push the boundary, and that some basic values and belief are most important, such as equality, justice, love. These are really something basic that we need to emphasize. Well, Jenny Chan, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Jenny Chan is a professor of sociology at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, and the author of *Dying for an iPhone: Apple, Foxconn, and the Lives of Chinese Workers*, co-authored with Mark Selden and Pun Nai, and forthcoming from Haymarket. Thank you for listening to the Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that emancipation of the working classes requires their fraternal concurrence. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Logan Dreher. This episode was edited by the glorious John Hanrahan, as was last week's interview with Kafoyato. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes or wherever, you can also leave us a nice review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. What also does that is you telling your friends about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And please do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this podcast up and running strong. Even a few bucks a month is a huge help. Thank you.